Hello everyone, uh, we're going to be transitioning to the more advanced navigational topics. And uh, one thing that I wanted to share with everybody is a couple of different tools that you're probably going to need to be familiar with in order to be successful with this. Again, there's 101 ways to do this, but I'm kind of a fan of doing things you know, the old fashioned way on a piece of paper, just to kind of keep things interesting. Keep in mind, it's not that I hate glass cockpits or digital computers. It's just that sometimes it's kind of fun to do things the old fashioned way. So I'm on this website called E6BX. Uh, again, I make no money from these guys. This is just a great website resource that I use for everything. And you notice it has a wide variety Variety of different calculations on here and of these calculations we're going to be interested in a few of them the first is going to be e6b calculator itself which is a beautiful tool for doing things like calculating wind correction angle it has everything as far as my heading my true speed true airspeed everything we could possibly imagine in the universe is all going to be on this particular area here now that where it gets a little interesting if we go back to the main website is they also have manual components for calculations as well including this really really nice one called time addition and subtraction which is the most greatest thing ever if you're trying to do uh, quick math problems for that purpose. Another thing I like on here is going to be true airspeed, and we're going to be exploring those just a little bit. Okay, so what are we going to need to know as far as, you know, future super navigators as far as uh, what we're going to be dealing with? Well, let's go pop over to the E6B calculator real quick. Uh, the first thing we're always going to be interested in is a value called course. Course refers to the true course that you need to travel with your aircraft with no magnetic correction, with no wind correction that you're going to be able to go ahead and use. Now, for example, if I head over to Sky Vector real fast, let's say I want to create a, I'll go ahead and I'll use the flight plan that I had from before. It's an awfully short flight plan. You'll notice that it gives me this little magnetic heading here. But the reality is because the world is not, have it, I should use proper English here, because of the projection that we're using here, notice that all of my lines of uh, longitude are vertical, it means that we're not actually pointing at the north that we need to actually travel at. As a matter of fact, when you get further and further and further and further up north, and the meridians all start running into each other, you run into a very, very interesting problem whereby all of our calculations are suddenly really, really, really badly skewed. So it's something that we're going to need to take into account. So the key thing is, if you're using something like Sky Vector and you want to get the true course, all you have to do is go over to the nav log, and if you take a look right here, it will give you something called track which is the actual most important component that's going to be the true course that we need. Obviously, it's a bit of a windy day today. So unfortunately, even though it's a pretty easy thing to fly on, our track is uh, absolutely nutty compared to our actual direction that we're actually going to travel in. Don't worry about that. The important thing is course is always true, not magnetic north. Next thing we're going to be interested in is something called true airspeed. And you're going to run to this calculation a million times. This is a messy calculation to say the least. Now, a lot of people, uh, when they think of true airspeed, they look at the little indicator and say, hey, true airspeed. I got some bad news. That is not the true airspeed. That is your indicated airspeed, which needs to be converted up to three times in order to accurately get your airspeed. Remember, airspeed is not ground speed. I did a video a couple months ago kind of showing some of those details off. We're going to need a lot of information about this, and I'll show you how to calculate this today. The next thing we're going to be interested in is our wind direction our true wind direction, not magnetic wind direction. It's going to be something we're always going to be have to figure out. Now, one of the problems we're going to encounter a lot when we're doing navigation in a more advanced way is we're going to have to figure out the wind direction and wind speed without knowing what they are. And then after we figure them out, we have to compute everything again to know whether we actually need to point the plane. Next thing we're going to be interested in is a wind correction angle, which is actually pretty easy to calculate. Heading is going to be where we're actually going to be pointing the nose of the plane, not corrected for magnetic deviation. It's called true heading. Now, again, this is going to get really messy really, really quickly. So I'll try to, again, give you a little bit of background, and we'll go more in depth in each one of these pieces later. Next thing, of course, we're always going to be interested in is how far do we need to travel. We're going to be interested in our ground speed. Our ground speed is a messy number because we have to figure out our true airspeed, which, as you'll see, is very challenging to calculate. We're going to have to calculate the effect of the wind on our airspeed that affects our ground speed before we can go ahead and use our ground speed. Once we've calculated our ground speed, we can then do things like take our distance and then calculate how far we're actually going. So if I do, uh, let's say we're doing uh, 950 miles at a 113 knot ground speed, that gives me a flight time of eight and a half hours. We can't actually safely do this in a 172 because the aircraft would run out of fuel long before we get there. And of course, after you calculate all of these components, we're going to be interested in what our fuel per hour is. Now, if we were in a Cessna, we'd be doing about 9.6 gallons per hour, which means we need 80 gallons. Now, a Cessna, of course, so 172, I should refer to, only holds 50. So this flight is actually impossible. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first calculation we're going to be interested in today. And that's going to be something called true airspeed. True airspeed is a messy, messy calculation. And let me show you why. 
Let me go back over to our main E6B. I'm going to go ahead and cruel down here, and we're going to go ahead and grit our true airspeed. True airspeed is a function of a lot of things. It's a function of our indicated altitude. That's the altitude you read off of your altimeter. It is a function of your altimeter setting. It is a function of your outside air temperature. It is a function of your calibrated airspeed. Calibrated airspeed, what is that? Well, let me go grab a POH real quick. Now, ah, here we are. So an a aircraft POH, again, my uh, English is never always perfect here because, you know, science. You will notice that my speed that you see on the indicated airspeed is not the actual speed that the aircraft is actually moving. Now, you're all sitting there going, well, we knew that. That's wind. No, it's even more complicated than that. The instrument itself that's used for determining airspeed is not accurate. So as a matter of fact, if you look at a POH, it will tell you this is what your indicated airspeed will be. This is what the aircraft's actual airspeed will be. So check this out. If my flaps are up and my indicated airspeed is 40, my actual airspeed is 49 knots. Now on the other end, if my indicated airspeed is 140, my actual airspeed is 138. My calibrated airspeed, which is still not true airspeed. Now notice if I deploy my flaps, this number gets even weirder. Now, if I deploy my flaps the rest of the way, this number gets even weirder. Now, watch this. Let's say we have to use our alternative static pressure source. Notice what happens if I open the window of the plane. It causes my indicators to read incorrectly. Notice if I have my windows open, it causes my airspeed indicator to read incorrectly. Now, if we scroll down here, uh, let's say that we're in a stall situation and my center of gravity shifts. That's also going to cause your calibrated airspeed, which is your indicated airspeed, corrected for errors to be incorrect. So you can see here already, this is getting very messy very quickly. So let's go ahead and go through an example. Let's say we're traveling at 120 knots indicated airspeed, my flaps are up. This would mean that my calibrated airspeed, which is actually the airspeed that would be correct if the instrument were perfect, would read 118 knots. Now, if we pop back over here into my true airspeed calculator, we can actually dial this in. Notice this is indicated or calibrated. Calibrated is accurate. I've got some great news, everybody. The calibrated airspeed isn't broken inside the flight simulator. It's actually pure. IAS and CAS are the same. Now, if you're flying in the real world, they're not, and you have to be prepared for that. But anyway, what do we say? We say we're doing 120. That means we're doing 118. Now, the next thing we need to know is we need to know what our outside air temperature is going to be. Again, this is inside of the aircraft. You need to have a thermometer so you can calculate this. Let's say the outside air temperature is 10 degrees Celsius. Now, let's say that we're climbing at an altitude, or so not climbing, let's say we're cruising at an altitude of 3,500 feet, and then our altimeter setting is, let's call it 30 out 6. So this would say that even though my, indica my airspeed indicator says I'm doing 120 knots, I'm actually doing 118 knots as measured by the instrument, but in reality, I'm traveling at 124 knots true air speed. Now, you're all sitting there going, oh, okay, that, that, that kind of blew my mind a little bit. Uh, can you give us another example? Yeah, sure, let me write one out for you for you to try. Okay, let's take a look at my example here. You're at 18,500 feet, probably triple prop. Uh, altimeter is 299.2. The temperature is minus 29 Celsius. What is our true airspeed. What is our TAS? Again, this is not ground speed. This is our true airspeed. Let's see if we can figure it out. If you want to try it on your own, go ahead and pause the video now. All right, let's work it out, shall we? So we're going to come in here. Uh, we're going to assume there is no issue with IAS versus CAS. Again, CAS is going to be dependent on the aircraft. If there was an issue with that, we'd have to come into our book and we'd have to find what our actual indicated airspace versus speed versus calibrated airspeed. I got some other bad news, by the way. There's another factor we have to calculate. It's your F factor that does not apply to us. Turns out when you get close to the speed of sound, your indicated airspeed actually shifts and it becomes incorrect. It will show you at a higher speed than you're actually moving. It's called pitot shock error if you want to check it out. So anyway, let's run through this. So we know we need to be at 18,500 feet. We know my altimeter setting is 2992. We know my outside air temperature is minus 29 Celsius. And we know that my indicated airspeed, again, we're not dealing with calibrated airspeed, we're dealing with a flight simulator here, is 270. That means my true airspeed is 355 knots, even though my little needle is telling me that I'm doing 270 knots. Uh, once you feel comfortable with this particular calculation, uh, you're going to be in great shape for our next calculation, which is going to be pressure altitude. 
So to get to pressure altitude, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the main page, pop over to pressure altitude. Pressure altitude is altitude corrected not for barometric pressure. It's corrected for standard pressure. So if you wanted to check out pressure altitude in a real aircraft, what you would actually do is you'd sit there and crank the little knob until it says 2992, and you'd read out what it says. So this is pretty straightforward. So let's say I'm just going to do 29.92. Let's say my feel I'm at uh, 5,000 feet. My pressure altitude, boop. 5,000 feet on the nose. But let's say I have to recalibrate this, and let's say that I got my 30 out 6. My indicated altitude, if you did 2992, would show 5,000 feet, even though my physical pressure altitude is now 4,860 feet. Uh, the opposite is also true. Let's say we go into a super low pressure area, and my altimeter setting is 2845. So that would actually show you as being an indicated if we were at 2992 at 5,000, but the aircraft is physically at 6,470 feet if we did not calibrate this. Now, you're probably sitting there going, whoa, 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 I'm, I'm, you've already lost me. What's the point of all this? It's because when we do our calculations for performance in navigation, we're going to have to set things up so that everything is in terms of true course, true airspeed, and true or pressure altitude. As a matter of fact, let's go look at the POH again. All right, take a look right here. Pressure altitude which means if we don't calculate for pressure altitude before we start trying to read this chart off, we've already done goof, so to speak. So again, everything is going to be in terms of pressure altitude for all of our calculations. All of our speed calculations are going to be in terms of true airspeed, which I've already showed you how tricky it is to actually calculate. And all of our other calculations, of course, are going to be in terms of Celsius as well as true course. Now, if you can't convert to these particular units, you're going to get yourself in a bad way. Now, a few of you are probably saying, um, could you just do a spreadsheet? that can do this? Um, the answer is, yeah, you could absolutely do a spreadsheet that does these calculations for you. This is just more things that you have to think of of a pilot. But hey, you're watching the intermediate videos is probably what you're into anyway. So there's one more thing I want to share with you before uh, you know, I kind of let everybody loose. And uh, next time we take a look at a little bit tougher calculations. And that is the mighty E6B flight calculator. Now, when I first was learning to fly, this is the tool we had. You know, when I first started, I had this little paper one. And then for Christmas one year, somebody actually bought me a nice metal one. This is what we would actually be using in the old days. Let me zoom in a little bit so you can actually see what I'm doing here. This is what we'd actually be using in the old days in order to calculate our different performance. For example, if I wanted to calculate pressure altitude, you know, I could sit here and go ahead and set the pressure altitude and actually read out true altitude. I've got some bad news, everybody. If you take pressure altitude and hit temperature on it, it shifts your actual physical altitude around. Nobody said this would be easy, right? So the other thing this lets me do is do quick calculations as far as rate. So for example, if you take a look at this little needle right here, I can point this to, let's say, uh, 16. I'll pretend that this is 160 knots. And let's say I'm traveling for four hours and 30 minutes. Ta-da! I've traveled 720 nautical miles. You're saying, whoa, that, that's actually pretty cool. Yeah, it gets even better than that. Let's say that I want to go ahead and say I'm burning, uh, let's say, 14 gallons of fuel per hour and I have 20 gallons of fuel left. How much fuel does that give me? Boop. Looks like one hour and 25 minutes. So this is an amazing tool, but again, I just want to preview this. I'm not gonna be going through how to use this particular tool. It's a slick thing. There's great things online that'll actually show off how some of this stuff works. I just wanted to show you that once you pull away the digital tools, it gets a little bit more challenging, but at the same time, a lot of this stuff works really, really well. Okay, I'm gonna end the video right here. I think this is a pretty solid spot. Now that you know how to calculate your pressure altitude and true airspeed, you're going to be in much, much better shape when it comes to doing your calculations as far as trying to figure out what the wind is. Enjoy.